Good least. afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Simone Cavallaro, the director of the Stiegel Center. We're excited to host Matt Stoller for a conversation with Guy Rolnick on the impact of monopolies, the emergence of populism, and the future of democracy in the US and beyond. I'd like to thank uh, <clears throat> the European Policy Hub at the Harris School for their collaboration on this event. Before we start, please note, we are on the record and live streaming, so please silence your phones. As usual, the view expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stigler Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture and the various distortions uh, <clears throat> that special interest groups impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives, including the Capitalism Podcast, co-hosted by Luigi Zingales and Kate Waldock, and ProMarket, our blog. And this week, we're hosting our annual Antitrust and Competition Conference focused on digital platform, which will be covering the topics discussed today and many more. In fact, this event is part of our public outreach effort around the conference. Later this afternoon, in, co in cooperation with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs downtown, we're also hosting a discussion on big tech and democracy. In the evening, in the partnership with the uh, European Policy Hub, we will have a panel on the differences between US and EU approaches on regulate, regulating big tech. The conference is sold out, but you may watch it live stream, uh, and the link can be found on our website. Back to this afternoon. We look forward to an insightful conversation with our speakers, and please allow me to introduce them. Matt Stoller is, the fellow, is a fellow at the Open Markets Institute. Previously, he was a senior policy advisor to the Senate Budget Committee. He has also worked uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives on financial services policy, including Dodd-Frank and the foreclosure crisis. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vice, and New Republic, and more. And this book on topics discussed today, Goliath, the 100-year war between monopoly, power, and populism, is due out this fall. Guy Rolnick is a clinical associate professor of strategic management at Booth. He teaches classes on the political economy of regulation and the news media. Guy has 30 years of experience in financial journalism and is credited with leading dramatic financial reforms in, in Israel. For the last few years, his work has been focused on the dyna dynamics of regulatory capture, a topic dear to the Stigler Center. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. All right. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, uh, today. Everything here is uh, streamlined. We we uh, live. We uh, will do a 45 minutes uh, uh, interview with uh, uh, Matt, and then we'll go for uh, a Q and A. Now, before I uh, start, I want to uh, uh, I want to give you the context and the setting that we know. We're going to discuss uh, monopolies in the United States and the history of the monopolies in the United States, but I need uh, all of us to understand the context of our uh, discussion today. So actually, Matt Stoller is one of those people that really benefited from being fired. So <laughs> two years ago, I assume, less than two years ago, uh, Matt and a group of his uh, 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 partners were fired by the New America uh, Foundation, which was a, in, an important think tank in the in DC, and there are competing narratives of what happened there. One thing is for sure, uh, Matt and his partner, uh, Barry Lynn, uh, criticized uh, monopolies, and one of their funders did not like it, and there was some discussion. At the end of that discussion, uh, uh, they were fired from, uh, from their job, and actually they benefited tremendously because it got a lot of media attention. Actually, it went viral, the whole story, and it coincided with a lot of people in the United States that, and all over the world that became interested in, uh, in monopolies. So they were able very quickly to put together a new institute called the Open Market uh, Institute and to raise significant funding to that institute. And actually in the last two years, they've become one of the most important forces in the country leading the discussion, the conversation on monopoly power 
in the, in the United States. So Matt, thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, today. I, was, I hope I was pretty accurate the way I described the, uh, the process, but you can uh, uh, chime in later and tell us how you view it. So before we go into your book and your work on, uh, on, on monopoly power, what I, what, what I really want to understand is that you have dedicated the last seven years of your life to the questions of monopoly and concentration in the US. And I want to understand the context. What happened to you one day that you decided that you have this obsession with uh, monopoly, please? <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So a couple of things. So first of all, monopolization, concentration is at this point a systemic feature of the American political economy. Everything from search engines to social media to peanut butter to hospitals. There are there's an enormous consolidation, fewer choices, less political liberty. For me, and I think for most people who dislike monopoly, I, I just dislike bullies. And I've always disliked bullies. And what happened in two, I was working in the financial, uh, on the, uh, in Congress during the financial crisis. And, um, well, first of all, I grew up in Miami, which just gives you a weird sense of the world. Uh, but in, and thank you for the one laugh about Miami. Um, in, in 2009, uh, I, was, I started working for this guy named, who was a congressman, and he was on the Financial Services Committee. And the whole world was collapsing, and nobody knew what was going on. The bankers didn't know. The lobbyists didn't know. The Fed didn't know. And they, they basically just said, here's a desk. Good luck with the financial crisis. And it was completely bewildering, and it took a few years to understand that banks were too large and too systemically interconnected and that they had produced risk that undermined um, not just the financial position and the jobs of many people, but also democracy itself. So a couple years later, I, and I, I wondered why there was sort of no understanding of the political tradition that we had to, to deal with financial power. At least there was not really any understanding that I had heard of to deal with financial power at the time. And, uh, but a couple years after that, in 2011, I read a book by Barry Lynn, who has uh, started the think tank that I'm, I'm now a part of, that was, about, uh, that was called Cornered. Uh, and it was about monopolization. And he told a political story about why concentration happened. And he mentioned a law called the Robinson-Patman Act, which had constrained chain stores in the 1930s and 19, uh, 1940s. And I had never heard of the law. And, but it was, it was interesting. And it, it turns out that the guy who wrote that law was a guy that uh, a congressman named Wright Patman, who had been the last banking chair in the 1960s and 70s, who had been the last one to really try to constrain financial power, which is something I learned in Congress when I was there. And I realized that there was this incredible story about monopolization and financial concentration and democracy that no one had really kind of told for many years. And I got really interested in it. And I started to try to understand those relationships. And once I get uh, interested in something, I get kind of obsessive. So for, so for the last sort of seven years or so, I've been working on policy, but also doing research to try to understand this tradition that I think a lot of the new anti-monopolists are kind of a part of. Okay. So in your uh, book that culminates the work that you've been doing in the last uh, five or seven uh, years, you offer the readers a narrative, or should I say lenses and perspective, on the history of the last century in the United States. And you offer us a totally different narrative than the one that you're used to. It's not Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, uh, liberals, big government, small government, and all those issues. You offer to us lenses that actually it has a lot to do about monopoly power and democracy. You have five minutes now to convince us that this is the way to look at the history of the last century in this country. Right. So it, it goes back. Uh, I, the, the, the subtitle is 100 years, uh, the 100 year war between um, monopoly power and democracy. But, you know, that, that's really get starting with, with kind of the emergence of industrial corporations. And also 100 years, it's good for marketing. Um, <laughs> But you could actually trace this back to the founding of the U.S., and you can trace it back in, in, um, in Ang Anglo-American uh, traditions. The East India Company, 
right? We traditionally learn about the East India Company and the Boston Tea Party as a revolt against taxes. In fact, it was a revolt against monopoly. There was anger at how they were using tax policy to consolidate the tea trade, and there was fear over what that meant for the liberties of the colonists, not just in the, in the, the colonies here, but, but globally. So uh, you, you can roll that, that forward into the 19th century where you saw enormous uh, anti-monopoly sentiment when you saw the development of railroads, telegraphs, telephones, steel industry, oil industry. And then what most people understand as kind of the start of modern antitrust, which is the 1890 Sherman Act. And over the course of um, monopoly and financial policy was the fulcrum, one of the key fulcrums for debate for the whole 19th century and really the uh, American experiment up until the 1970s. And what happened, and it's absolutely incredible, but it, what happened is there was this kind of giant um, episode where we were um, made to forget these traditions, where we constrained our uh, banks and our monopolies and allowed us to trade as free commercial, uh, as citizens in, in free and open commercial markets. And when that happened in the, in the 1970s, there were scholars on the right and there were scholars on the left that built a kind of a different tradition, a different historical architecture, stories that I learned as a kid that we learned. Um, we were unequipped to deal with some of the chaotic uh, problems that we saw in the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. The roll-ups in a whole bunch of industries, in, uh, in media industries, the roll-ups in retail, in technology, we lost our ability to know who we are and to know how to relate to the concentration of, of power in the private sector. Instead, politics shrank to become about maybe some taxing and redistribution and then a whole bunch of cultural arguments, which are important, but that's not the totality of politics. Politics in America prior to the 1970s has been about access to markets, the ability of Americans as tradespeople, and, and there, there's a global aspect this, to this as well, because the middle of the 20th century was, you know, people used to look at Nazi Germany as a, as a function of concentrated financial power. Um, so there was a whole anti-fascist element to this as well. And somehow all of that got erased in the 1970s. And the net effect was that in 2009, when we ha saw the most catastrophic financial crisis that we had seen since 1929, we just were completely... Uh, ignorant of how we had dealt with these kinds of political crises in our past. Uh, so that's, I guess, kind of the, and I'm not sure if that's convincing, but that's my story. That's how I came upon it. And when I looked into the history and I, and I read all of these hearings and talked to people who kind of knew of some of these older political figures and, and looked at protests and how people thought about politics, it was very clear that there was an entirely different model for how people conceptualized what democracy meant. And I, I, this is kind of something that a lot of people laugh at when I mention it. But in the 1940s, 50s, and before then, people associated American capitalism with equality, right? Today, if you mention American capitalism, everyone's like, oh, well, that's just, that just means maybe innovation. But definitely, it means radical inequality. Uh, but actually, that's, that's a relatively new way of conceptualizing what our political economic system is about. Um, the other, the other point here is that what happened in the 1970s is, is it's not just Republicans and Democrats, but it turned into this kind of pro-business, anti-business model. When traditional monopoly and anti-monopoly politics is about how you do business, right? Whether you have open markets and um, multiple competitors competing to provide goods and services, or whether you have a monopolist governing a market. And so it's not about uh, the traditional model in the 19th century was monopolists are inhibitors of business. And the idea is to liberate the energies of commerce by pushing away these bottlenecks, these inhibitors of, of liberty and freedom. So that's the, the traditional story that we, uh, we had until the 1970s, then we forgot about it, and now we are faced with this incredibly concentrated political economy and what is, I, I suspect, a, a kind of set of constitutional, political, and economic crises that we're facing because of that. Okay, so let's go back for a second and drill down for, uh, uh to the history aspect of it. And specifically, I'd like you now to focus on uh, uh, two periods. A lot of people associate the anti-monopoly movement in this country with the progressive era, uh, late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, 
in your book, you bring a different narrative that actually the era, the golden age of fighting monopoly in the United States is actually right up during and right after World War II, the new dealers. New dealers are the heroes if in, in many ways of your, of your book. So I'd like you first to explain to us, uh, talk about the anti-monopoly movements and political economy in the beginning of the century and then go to what happened, you know, the, you know Teddy Roosevelt versus FDR, please. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt's one of them. So, okay, so I'll try to do the, the emergence of corporate America, right? The politics, uh, the 1912 is basically the election that set up the politics of corporate America, right? You had all this incredible technology that was developed. You had a whole series of roll-ups, like you see a roll-up today in like online advertising or online retail in the 1890s, 1900s. It was roll-ups in the steel industry and a whole series of other industries. And people were very unhappy about that. Railroad accidents and just were killing lots of people. There was financial crises. So in 1912, you finally had this debate between, um, uh, between Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt had been president for basically two terms. And as president, he had used the Sherman Antitrust Act aggressively, and he was the first president to do that. So there was this, there's this perception that Teddy Roosevelt was the great trust buster. But in fact, Teddy Roosevelt didn't like uh, the Sherman Act, and he, didn't, he actually believed in monopolies. He just used the Sherman Act kind of as a cudgel to show J.P. Morgan, who was the kind of boss of America, for lack of a better word, the boss of sort of corporate structures, he was just like, no, uh, it should be a political official in charge, not a banker. And so he used the Sherman Act as the only law that he had to actually sue J.P. Morgan and kind of bludgeon him into submission. And after he did sue J.P. Morgan, they kind of came to an arrangement. And after that, he never brought another case against a Morgan company after Northern Securities in 1904. And then in 1912, J.P. Um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually wanted to, to repeal the Sherman Act, but he lost. And Woodrow Wilson, who was advised by Louis Brandeis, won. And that really started the bringing anti-monopolism, which had been a 19th century tradition, into the 20th century. The founding of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Trade Commission, the Clayton Act. But Wilson was interrupted by World War I. And uh, World War I interrupted and sort of got rid of the anti-monopoly movement at that point. You saw the 1920s, which was this era that's somewhat like today, a lot of self-dealing, a lot of corruption, a lot of um, uh, links between politics and big business. And uh, that ended with the Great Depression, which was the collapse of the money trust that Wilson had been fighting. And in the 1930s, you saw the emergence of new dealers who were essentially 19th century kind of populist influence types, many of whom who had been trained under Woodrow Wilson and many of whom were actually in Congress, and their goal was to decentralize private concentrated power. So a lot of the things that happened during the New Deal, which I guess in, in our historical narrative today, not the one I'm telling in the book, was about centralizing power in government, centralizing power in unions, building a regulatory state. That was, that, that's actually not the story that I'm telling in this book. What I see the New Deal as, and this is kind of as I was going through these archives, what I found is, oh wait, these guys wanted to go after the money trust. These guys were afraid of Andrew Mellon, who's one of the, the big characters and the Treasury Secretary in the 1920s and a, a monopolist and a banker. These guys were watching what was going on in Italy. They were watching what was going on in Germany and Japan, and they were afraid that that would happen here. And so their goal with a lot of the laws that they were passing was to decentralize private power. Now, it looks kind of in retrospect, in, if you tell the story a certain way, which is how a lot of people have told it, that's also part of this book, but it looks like what we saw was the emergence of a giant centralized government apparatus. But in fact, what you saw was democratic institutions decentralizing what was private centralized management of the economy, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt called the um, informal economic government of the United States. So this, it's like the New Deal, when I look at it, is a gang fight between the monopolists and uh, and people supporting democracy. And this was happening all over the world. It's just that in the United States, it happened that the people that believed in liberal democracy ended up winning. And in other countries, sometimes it was the uh, centralization in the hands of the state, which was the Soviet Union, centralization in the hands of 
uh, big business and, and uh, the, the takeover of the state by big business, which was a, a range of fascist movements around the world. So that, when I look at, at the, the New Deal, that's what I see. And um, you saw very assertive antitrust rules. You saw a regulatory state that, um, even without antitrust, was breaking up companies like electric utilities, banks, airlines. Um, and you saw an incredibly assertive Congress that was opposed to uh, corruption. So it's, it's a different narrative than the one that we're used to hearing. And it's, it focuses on financial power as the focal point of our politics, as opposed to a whole bunch of other ways that you could tell the story. Okay, so to, to make it more vivid, perhaps what we should know now is uh, uh, explain how did antitrust work in the 40s and the 50s, in the uh, Arnold Thurman days and FDR, and how it's being enforced in the last uh, 30 years. What kind of mergers were banned and what kind of uh, uh, rules and guidelines do we see in the 50s and the 60s in the golden age of antitrust that would be to approved instantaneously today? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with, there's a, there's a case called Vaughn's Groceries, which I think it was 1966. And that, in that case, the Supreme Court uh, said that a merger of two grocery stores in Los Angeles that had 7% of the market was illegal. So 7% of the market just in one city was illegal, right? Now, and that, this was sort of the, the golden age of, of antitrust. The laws were incredibly strong and the courts were, were very aggressive about that. And to give you some context as to why that is, from the 19, basically 19 teens until the 1930s and 40s, you had a war all across the country between chain stores, the A&P supermarket was kind of the massive chain store of its day, and people that wanted to have um, stores in their local communities controlled by people in those communities. So the only, the only area in the 1920s was a very scary decade, but it was the only um, policy area that the KKK and the N NAACP agreed on was opposition to chain stores because it was about local control um, and uh, so you saw massive, um, Huey Long called chain stores. I'd rather have thieves and gangsters in my state than chain stores. There was, it was just this totally different world. I mean, this is what politics was about. And you had um, fights, uh, brutal fights in the 1930s. You had criminal indictments. I mean, you, like, there was this sense that, that the A&P was taking over the farming apparatus of the country the retailing apparatus of the country, anyone who made stuff. They also had a big wholesaling arm, so they sold to lots of third-party stores who were also competing with the A&P retail. So it was this threat to all of these communities and all of these independent tradespeople. And that was the context. And ultimately, the New Dealers ended up building coalitions to actually push back A&P, and you did see a reemergence of independent retail. Um, but the context of uh, those brutal fights led to the 1950s and 1960s, a series of suits, one of which was against the, several were against the A&P, including criminal suit. Um, and uh, A&P was ultimately their wholesaling arm. They had to dissolve it. But then the, the net effect was you had incredible suspicion of concentrations of power. So if you mention Vaughn's Groceries today, and that's 7% to most antitrust lawyers, they'll be like, 7% of a local market? That's a joke. But if you actually understand the context and the fights that were going on that led to that, that decision and why there was this sense that we needed liberty, we needed control of local communities, it makes a lot more sense. That political story, they're all similar, similar suit against Alcoa, which was one of the most important antitrust cases that we've seen. It was sort of similar in importance to Standard Oil, except it was decided in 1945 when World War II was going on, so people were paying attention to other things. Um, but there were all of these massive fights, and I'll just name kind of one more, which is there was an, an incredible fight in the late 1930s and 1940s to break the stranglehold that, among others, the Mellon interests, so Mellon had died by this point, but that, that Mellon interests, that Rockefellers, that DuPonts had over the military-industrial defense base. Right? The desire to build up an armaments industry to defeat the Nazis, to build an air force, that was part of the anti-monopoly fight. And it was so this really colored the views of political officials from the 1940s until the 1970s. They saw the threats that monopolists put on them, on 
um, what they did in other countries and, uh, and how they organized the American political economy in very interesting and sort of frightening ways. And that's why there was this incredible suspicion of concentrated power. And that was the golden age. Yeah, so Matt, you know, when you, when you go through the history and you see the, uh, that you describe the golden age of uh, fighting antitrust was in the 40s and the 50s and maybe the beginning of the 60s and maybe the 60s, you know, so we, it also, in a way it's a bit uh, depressing because you think that what you need in order to get government to go after monopolists and, you know, uh, concentration of power is World War II. And the question is, how did this play? Is it because we were, you know, because of the war, because of the sentiments after the war, because of fascism and so on, this is the reason that we are able to get the support for this, which means that if we look forward into the future, we are not going to see any real uh, countervailing force to the monopolies until something really, really bad happens. Yeah, and all you need is a Great Depression and a war. <laughs> fixes everything. No, um, uh, that, no the, so it's not... So World War I concentrated power in dangerous ways, and World War II helped decentralize power, at least in the U.S. And then globally, a lot of our global international arrangements were structured to decentralize the corporate power in Germany and Japan as people were like, okay, enough. We've already done two of these wars. No more. We're going we're gonna to break up IG Farben. Um, but uh, World War I, I mean, Woodrow Wilson, when he came in, he almost did the New Deal. Like, he just got interrupted. I mean, in 18 months, he built the Federal Reserve, the FTC, the Clayton Act. He broke up AT&T. We've broken up AT&T three times in the 20th century. Wilson did it the first time. Uh, there was a, I think like a couple of weeks before World War I broke out, there was a report coming out from the Interstate Commerce Commission that basically said, you should really arrest William Rockefeller and some of the Morgan guys for what they did to this railroad, this New Haven Railroad. And it's, it's possible they would have done it if World War I hadn't interrupted. So you don't need a, a terrible depression and a war to actually do this. What you need is what we're experiencing right now, which is a resurrection of, of democracy, of citizens actually demanding that their political institution open their markets, respond to them, and govern assertively. We haven't governed in this country in a real way, and I think all over the world, I think you see center right and center left parties collapsing everywhere. There hasn't been assertive governance, which is to say structuring of markets on behalf of of um, public needs for, uh, for 40 years. And that's because we decided as a people that that's not what politics was about. So when you start to see a reemergence of the politics of anti-monopoly, uh, you start to see changes in our policy infrastructure. You see a lot of the discussion about breaking up Facebook. Facebook's already changing a lot of their practices in response to that pressure. It's the same thing with Amazon. Um, but when you actually start to see policymakers govern affirmatively and assertively and putting forward rules, um, you're going to see a lot more things like, you know, the beer market, which we all know that you can get craft beer or podcasting where there's a diversity of, of podcasts versus much more concentrated markets. And you're going to see that spread really quickly. Um, as long as we as a people want that, we can get it. It's just we haven't wanted it for a long time. Okay, so Matt, before we go into uh, Facebook and your optimism that we are on the cusp of uh, a new political economy and uh, decentralization in the economy, I want to address the elephant in the room. I want to talk about what happened after the uh, 50s and the 60s and how did we get to what in your mind is, less, is very lax antitrust uh, enforcement. I want to talk about the Chicago School and what happened since the 70s uh, uh, up until today. Okay, so, so th th writing this book was something of a challenge, that part of the book. The hardest part was to write the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, because how do you tell the story of forgetting, right? Like, what, there's no, I mean, there's no, like, there were massive protests and fascinating stuff in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s, 40s, World War II, I mean, that's a great story. But what about, like, a bunch of people forgetting? How do you tell that story? And what I, what I ultimately, obviously it wasn't that people forget it. What, what happened is people, there were some scholars that substituted different historical narratives for the ones that we understood. 
So the traditional historical narrative was the anti-monopoly story. They substituted a different narrative. And this wasn't just on the right. This was on the left and the right. And it all came from basically Thurston Veblen and H.L. Mencken, who were two writers intellectuals in the early 20th century. And they had influence over three men who I trace this to. One of them was John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a famous economist. And another, he created this idea that monopolies were progressive, the idea of affluence, that the United States economy was just this endless machine that would just churn out stuff automatically. There was no politics there, right? He created all this beautiful language about how to describe that. Um, he helped shrink politics on the left. Richard Hofstetter, the great historian, told a story about Anglo-Saxon status anxiety. He said all that stuff about railroads, that's all nonsense. What really was going on, it was a bunch of Anglo-Saxons that were worried that you had a lot of immigrants. And so really what we need to do is look at psychology, not political economy. And that his, his books were really important and influential in training generations of, of thinkers in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And then you had Aaron Director, who trained, who built the law and economics movement out of uh, the, the University of Chicago. And actually, there was a strong anti-monopoly conservative um, movement here, or set of scholars, Henry Simons and a set of others. And Aaron Director actually broke from that mold and um, became actually a sort of argued for uh, to, that concentration was irrelevant. And that what really, what really we should be doing when thinking about political economy is just doing very complex econometric analyses to determine whether, um, uh, whether something was too concentrated or not. Market structure and concentration was not a political problem. It was a scientific issue. We can just get the scientists to make these decisions. It was, it was all about shrinking politics. So Aaron Director trained a whole bunch of people, including uh, Robert Bork, um, and Henry Manny, and was, was a brother-in-law with Milton Friedman. And, and so it was, it was on the left, you saw this kind of shrinking of politics. Democrats became less interested in political economy and monopoly. And then on the right, you saw this, uh, the emergence of this idea that what we really need to do is kind of import science into the law and make the law conform to science, AKA this very sort of neoclassical version of economics. By the late 1970s, early 1980s, in the area of economics where there was focus on monopoly, which is industrial organizational economics, the debate was over. And, uh, and, and, and George Stigler, who was a, a colleague of, of Aaron Director, had won. He, you know, and, and, and Galbraith, who was sort of one of the, in the 1970s, was the most important left-wing economist, while they all hated each other, he didn't disagree with them about concentration. He was just like, yeah, that's not really where pol what politics is about. So the debate was over by the early 1980s, and you saw this incredible roll-up um, of power throughout the 1980s and 1990s without a lot of notice, really, from either side of the aisle. Because yeah. they've been taught not to see power. Yeah, I just want to mention that Henry Simons is, you know, George Stigler called him the prince of uh, Chicago, and in his uh, book, uh, Positive Plan for Laissez Faire, he depicts private monopolies as the biggest threats to our Right. Uh, society and economy, and you mentioned George Stigler. So George Stigler, I think in the 50s, wrote this piece in uh, Fortune magazine where he was very suspicious of bigness, of concentration. And then th your narrative is actually something happens there and uh, Aaron Director is the one that uh, is shifting those people right. to uh, pro-monopoly. Right, no, that's, that's uh, so, so Aaron Director, totally fascinating character. I think he's the most interesting character that I came across. So also Friedrich Hayek was a strong anti-monopolist. His, his the Road to Serfdom, one of the first, I think the first quote um, that he, the first poll quote on number, chapter one is from FDR from his speech on monopolies. So Hayek saw monopolies as as dangerous form of collectivism, just like Henry Simons. They were friends because of that. Or they were friends. I don't I'm not going to judge the, why they were friends, but they were um, they were friends, and they saw they were political allies, and um, they also were very uh, friendly with Director. Actually, Hayek and Simons brought Director in to run the uh, the free market pro uh, project, which was funded by this guy named Harold Lunau. And I Director in I guess 1950 1951, Lunau basically said to him, "So Henry Simons killed himself in uh, the late 1940s, and." Um, 
director and Lunau had some sort of discussion. And Lunau basically said to him, look, if you want to continue getting funding for this uh, project, which I'm a big fan of, I think we need to study the free market system, you've got to lay off this monopoly, this corporate monopoly stuff. And director figured out the law and economics framework. He figured out a way, and uh, Lunau himself is a, is a fascinating character as well, um, funded a lot of the Red Scare stuff. Um, but, uh, but director changed his view, and then he ended up persuading Milton Friedman that monopolies were not, uh, corporate monopolies were not a, a, a problem, that they were, when they did, they were a problem, they were a result of government policy. And if you just pulled back on government policy, then you could, um, you could get rid of, corp you could get rid of, of monopolies that were not efficient. And he turned monopolization into thinking about things like public schools. So public schools being a monopoly or unions or a whole series of other institutions that were that he framed as um, monopolization. Occupational licensing very early on, that state-sanctioned monopolies. That was Aaron Director. And then he trained a whole series of people. And his model was to basically take a scholar or take a young scholar, pair them with a Supreme Court decision. This is what he learned from, from um, H.L. Mencken. So he, he was, uh, Director was this um, former Trotskyite in uh, the 1920s. And uh, uh, he, he learned that you could make fun of, he, the weakness of the liberal mind is you can make fun of liberals for being uh, stupid and they'll believe it. And uh, it's the imposter syndrome. So they'll, they want to feel fancy. And he realized that if you just tell somebody who wants to feel fancy that they're a fraud unless they believe what you believe, that some of them are going to say, oh yeah, no, I'm not a fraud, I'm not a fraud, I have fancy degrees and everything, I, 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 I agree with the science. And so he put a scholar behind every Supreme Court decision that he felt was problematic and said, make fun of this decision for, uh, not, for, uh, for not adhering to economics. Make fun of the Supreme Court for not understanding economics. And this is, George Priest wrote this. George Priest is one of director's um, students. So this is a Yale Law professor who said this was, this was his strategy. And so it was, a, it was a strategy to undermine the confidence of anti-monopolists. And it, it, it worked. It worked really well in the 1970s because you saw a whole series of financial crises and you saw a whole series of problems in the 1970s. Like the whole train system went bankrupt in 1970. I have a I have a chapter on Penn Central, which is such a weird and fun story. There were all of these crises that were happening in the 1970s that had to do with like an out-of-control financial system, and the liberals just had no answer because they hadn't thought about political economy in a real way for 20 years. I mean, there was Wright Patton, there were a few others that were, that were fighting, but there was a total lack of thinking about political economy, and Aaron Director had thought very carefully about what a political economic order would, should look like. And he had built a whole political movement to do that. And he had the, the architecture, much as there's a sort of vibrant debate today, there was a vibrant debate in the 1970s. And they just, they just did an amazing job of persuading people, both Democrats, Republicans, and business people, and union leaders, that you had to let concentrated capital go free, or you were going to continue to have financial crises and inflation and a whole series of of problems that look like they were going to bring down society. So Matt, uh, today pro-business uh, policies is mostly associated with, uh, with the uh, uh, conservatives and the Republicans, but uh, two years ago you wrote a piece that went viral on the internet in the Atlantic, tracing actually the monopolization in the last 30 years to what happened in the Democratic Party. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so... <laughs> So Democrats, at least in my lifetime, have never been very interested in business. They just don't, it just doesn't animate them. And I've always loved business. It's, it, I've always loved um, thinking about banking, thinking about how we build things, make things, sell things, distribute things. And as it turns out, un, until the 1970s, um, the Democratic Party was the party of small business and the party of, of open markets. And, um, and that, was, that was fundamental to how Democrats thought about themselves. We are a party of the small proprietor. And there were a lot of problems with that. It's not like all small business people are super ethical. Um, but, uh, but there was a belief that if you have big business dominating that 
that's much more dangerous than having a whole series of, of small business people. In, in a town, if you have 10 business people, 10 stores selling, selling a bunch of stuff, you have 10 choices to work for. If you place a one store, one chain store on top of that, one Walmart, you only have one place to work for. And so there was a, there was a vision of a, of a kind of, that goes back to Jefferson, um, sort of Jefferson without the slavery, um, of, of a society in which small proprietors, yeoman farmers, middle class, we have different ways of saying it, but individual citizens having some sovereignty over their business, uh, over their commerce. And that idea was that social justice flowed through trade. Social justice flowed through commerce. And in the 1970s, now particularly 1975, you saw a new class of Democrats come into the party. 1978, same thing for the Republicans. The new class were Naderite types. They were very focused not on the business person, not on the producer, but on the consumer. So it was a shift from citizen to consumer. And that was the consumer rights movement. And the, the 1975 class was called the Watergate baby class in the wake of Watergate. So Bill Clinton was a Watergate baby. He lost his first race. It was a 1974 race. It was more a generational thing. And they came in and immediately started wiping out a whole series of rules that had been put in place to protect the small shopkeeper and producer because they thought that that inhibited lower prices for consumers. And because they didn't, they didn't care what, about how business was structured. It, that just wasn't what politics was to them. And so after that, you saw a very different Democratic Party where people just didn't and the change was, was very quick. I mean, in 1974, you had a, a massive new class that was elected. 76, you had a massive new class was elected. Um, and by the 1980s, you, you, know, you started to see uh, just kind of Democrats were in, were in crisis and were trying to find a new identity. And they did. And they found that identity where they would say, well, we're going to do, we're going to make social arguments, but we're basically going to agree on a, um, with law and economics movement on a concentrated corporate structure. And I don't want to give you the, the sense that law and economics was a Republican movement because it wasn't. It was an intellectual movement that dominated thoroughly, thoroughly in, in both parties and persuaded the most important policymakers in both parties that that was, uh, that was the way to handle, give the economy to the scientists and then have your fights over everything that's not the economy. Or if you want to argue about the economy, you can argue about lower or higher taxes or how much money to give to poor people, but let the, don't, screw the, don't screw the economy up or you'll get all the crises that you had in the 1970s. Very different democratic politics, uh, very, uh, and, and it was the lack of fighting from the democratic side that led to monopolization. It, it, it was embarrassing. The Democrats were constantly attacking the Republicans for being too favorable to monopoly, and the Republicans responded by being more aggressive on monopoly. It was when the Democrats stopped fighting, when the Democrats stopped seeing concentrated political economic power that the uh, economy concentrated um, pretty radically. And this is also a worldwide story. It, this is not, it didn't just happen in America. I mean, you, have not, you will probably notice that the, a lot of these concentrated aspects of the political economy are just are heavily concentrated in Europe and Asia and all over the world as well. So tomorrow in the Stigler conference, we're going to have uh, Chris Hughes, the co-founder of uh, Facebook that called for the breakup of Facebook and will probably also be discussing the uh, addictive, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, fact that uh, those uh, algorithms are made to be addictive. And I will tell the audience that some of the audience don't know that you are uh, ad addicted to Twitter. That's right. And, and, but actually, but more seriously... Uh, well, I, I don't have a problem. Yeah, you it's have... Fine. <laughs> it's okay. fine. It's fine. I'm fine. So uh, <laughs> most of the people who are interested in, uh, in uh, anti-monopoly and antitrust United States are now following you on Twitter. You have a lot of uh, followers there. The people who follow your Twitter feed see that you have, you are targeting a lot of pro-monopolies, as you described them, people. But also there is another culprit that appears time and again in your Twitter uh, uh, feed, and this is Barack Obama, and I want to understand why. <laughs> so, I mean, the basic, okay, so what I saw during the financial crisis was this concentrate, there was, there was this incredible moment where you had, um, nobody knew what anything was worth, right? So. All of a sudden, all the financial assets 
Nobody knows what they're worth. And all of a sudden, this weird thing happens where all of these powerful people started to say, because they didn't know what they had, they were like, maybe equality, more equality is a good thing, because they were afraid. There were, the Rawlsian veil was pulled over everyone. And so Jack Welch said, maybe the shareholder model of capitalism doesn't make sense. And there were, there were a whole bunch of people that sort of said that. We started to re-examine um, first principles about what our political economy was supposed to do. And I, I saw this in the 2009 because they were throwing all these things about banking at all of us young, dumb staffers. This is what we need. We need derivatives, blah, blah, blah. And, and no, they never said this is what a banking system is for. So at that moment, in 2008, 2009, 2010, there was this opportunity to restructure our political economy and make decisions it all became political again. Like we had thought that banks and corporations, at least I did, were apolitical, technical, scientific institutions. They just did what they did. Now there was this moment to restructure all of it. And Barack Obama made the decision to, to reconcentrate power. That's what the bailouts were about. Made the decision to not do anything for uh, Homeowners in the main store of middle class wealth in this country was home ownership. And so you saw five to seven trillion dollars of wealth just disappear from the middle class. And then you saw, uh, you know, the stock market came back pretty quickly. You saw the reflation of financial assets in the hands of people who had been financiers and monopolists. And so today, you, um, so that, that's what Barack Obama did. That was the political, that's really the political story of the Obama administration. And he is a, I think people have very strong uh, views about what a decent man he is and how there were no scandals. And there's this sort of sense among Democrats of, of, how, um, of how that was when we could respect the White House. That was when we could respect our leaders. This is somebody that I would be proud for my children to know and honor. But if you think about what is the purpose of the rule of law, what is the purpose of our democracy? And you have, to, you have to look at what actually happened. And the concentration of power, both in the hands of finance, but also the monopolization, and that's when you saw Facebook, Google, Amazon concentrate massive amounts of power. That happened, and that, that happened because of political decisions that Barack Obama made, that his subordinates made, and that in many ways this president is continuing and that Bush made it as well, that was part of a, of a tradition of bad ideas. And in order to deal with those bad ideas, in order to liberate ourselves, in order to make us free to self-govern, we have to reckon with the bad choices that we have made and that we have enabled our policymakers to made, make. And so the, the character that I think people are least willing to reckon with in terms of what they actually did while in office is Barack Obama. All right, so this is Matt Stoller coming to Hyde Park to criticize Chicago School and Barack Obama. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. We have 13 minutes for Q&A now. Yes, please. Hi, first of all, thank you for coming in and sharing with us. I'm um, curious if you can dig a little more into why, or is sort of the moral framework of, of why it can be bad to have monopolies. I see a lot about the, the crisis of meaning uh, among, you know, lowering life expectancies among certain Americans. Is that rolled up with it? And like on the other side, there's that, well, we have more stuff. We can buy more stuff at Walmart. So that's a good thing. Is, is that a tension you see in, in why monopolies are bad? Or like what's your sort of framework on the, on the, the moral side of it? Yeah, so there's a number of ways that you can look at problems with concentration life expectancy is, is going down, but you see lower productivity, lower uh, small business formation, or not, um, you see uh, income inequality, regional inequality is pretty severe. It's a result of monopolies pulling wealth from rural areas and concentrating them in, in a few mega cities. But the most fundamental, the moral question, and you framed it correctly, it's a moral question, is who governs, right? So Brandeis and actually Milton Friedman both basically define monopolies the same thing in the same way. They said a monopoly, or I'll use Brandeis, a monopoly is a unified control of a recognized branch of trade or service. Right? So it's governing a market. It's setting the terms and services of that market, what people pay, what the whole supply chain looks like, who works there. Do we believe as a people that in 
a specific market where there can be competition. There's some markets where, you, like an electric utility, it doesn't make sense to build two of them. But in a lot of markets, you can have multiple ones or you can regulate to have competition. Do we as a society believe that one person should be making those decisions about a particular market? Right? That's, that's a, a mini government, and that's how people used to talk about it. Or do we believe that we should have multiple competitors and the rules set publicly by our democratic institutions and by competitors? That's just a fundamental political question. There's no right answer to that. It's just what do you think of as the right way to structure a society? I'm curious a little bit more on the, the bailout point you made, given the context of where we were at and how concentrated power was. I'm wondering what, what you would have seen as the better alternative at that time. Was it let them fail and deal with the consequences of recreation, take the bailout money and give it to homeowners to make sure they could stay solvent in their homes? I'm curious your thoughts on that. I mean, do another new deal, right? You, you, you keep the banks... I mean, the banks were, were keystone pieces that if they failed, it would have been catastrophic. But you, there's no reason why those bankers themselves should have been able to keep their money. So first of all, prosecute, right? That's one of the things in the book. In the 30s, FDR prosecuted, right? And they lost a bunch of cases, but they went after the bankers. They said what they did was wrong. And investigate. I was so... In, I, so I worked on the Financial Services Committee, and from 2007 to 2011, when Barney Frank was in charge, the banking, financial service committee in the House did not issue a single subpoena, right? This is a moral statement that they wanted to keep power concentrated in the same, in the hands of the people who got us into the, these problems. So just decentralize that power and then go through and break up the monopolies that exist throughout the rest of the political economy. That's what I would have liked to have seen done. But of course, that's now that I've written this book, that wasn't in 2009. I didn't know any any of this stuff but that's what they did in the new deal um so when you started speaking about uh you know barack obama i thought you were gonna talk about obamacare because uh people like jonathan tepper who are also anti-monopoly on the other side who write for american conservative for example uh blame obamacare on uh, you know, rising healthcare costs, and they believe, uh, you know, Medicare for all with the new, you know, the Green Deal, for example, is going to only increase healthcare costs uh, going forward and put money in these uh, monopolists in the healthcare industry. What are your thoughts on uh, on the Green Deal and Medicare for all? Yeah, so so healthcare is an incredibly concentrated area. I mean, it, hospitals are just, you know, the it's 18% of the US GDP versus you know, 9% in every other country and our, our outcomes are worse. And that's just, there's this article written in 2003 in New England Journal of Medicine. It's the price is stupid. It's just concentration. It's concentration in pharmaceuticals, concentration in PBMs, concentration in hospitals. Again, same part of the same story I'm telling here, although I didn't really go into it that much, is the early 1980s, you started to see roll-ups of hospitals. Um, you can't, if you're a doctor, you can't hang a shingle anymore because you have to negotiate with insurance companies and those are, they're too powerful. You have to use hospital facilities and there are no, you know, there's no, there's only one hospital to negotiate with, one hospital chain. So what I look at and what my organization, Open Markets, looks at in healthcare is how do you decentralize power in the, in healthcare markets? And that will have a, a pretty aggressive way, that will reduce costs and improve quality really, really quickly. Um, you describe a period of like public forgetting um, after like World War II where things were decentralized. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about like earlier political history um, and the consolidation of power that's built into our political system. You sort of describe it as a check to the economic system, but my understanding is that there's also consolidation within politics that's can you, can you describe a little bit? That's a little abstract. I'm not sure what you're talking sure, about. Sure, sorry. Um, just like our constitution was built to sort of consolidate power in the hands of few as, as well as this sort of monopoly system in the economy that we're having. Um, the history you're describing is basically in the 1900s. Is there anything you looked into prior to that that might have sort of affected what is going on now? Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, re I wrote a an early chapter, which I tossed out, about the Boston Tea Party um, and about how that was a revolt, rebellion against monopoly. And um, 
you, you know, Je Jefferson wanted an anti-monopoly provision in the Constitution, but he was, uh, it, didn't, it didn't get in there. But you saw, you know, in 1791, you saw the, the Postal Act, which set up a, a decentralized um, or a, a large uh, open access network that, without censorship or without much censorship uh, that didn't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, you saw, like, uh, and then, you know, the, the, in the, the first chapter, I go into battles um, over slavery, over um, the whiskey rebels. There was, America's not one thing. The founders didn't have one unified vision. The American experiment, it, it came out of the Enlightenment, it, it, it's a battle between aristocrats and, and anti-monopolists. And, and we have always been part of that battle. And so the, the, the fulcrum for this book, and I think the fulcrum for way Democrats and Republicans used to look at the world was Jefferson versus Hamilton, right? So um, Jefferson being the great Democrat, Hamilton being the great aristocrat. And so some of the things that you saw that were, very, that were about concentrating power was the first bank of the United States, the, the first national debt, um, this great book called Founding Finance by William Hoagland about that. And then you saw the election of 1800, um, some very scary and fun to learn about things in the 1790s. Um, the revolution of 1800 when Jefferson was elected and a lot of, of decentralization of power. I'm leaving out a lot of really brutal, terrible things because that's not part of this, this story. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like avoid that. But it just in terms of the political economy among white citizens uh, at the time, those were the, those were the debates. And so it wasn't that the Constitution was one thing or the other. The Constitution was you know, it was a compromised document among a bunch of politicians that were lying to each other and they were just battling about what they believed. Uh, just a, a, a quick one. You mentioned about um, Americans being seen as consumers and not as citizens right. uh, at some point. Would you say that that's the culmination of uh, state capture? These monopolies then taking on political power and running uh, politics? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and there's two ways to understand that. One is a monopoly gives money to politicians and runs the, has a lot of influence over government. And that's just a standard problem of corruption that you'll see anywhere. The more interesting problem is when the monopoly actually engages and does state-like functions. So Mark Zuckerberg choosing to keep our election, election, electoral infrastructure all over the world safe, right, where Facebook is actually the regulator of our, of our electoral systems globally, right? Or at least an important part of it. And you see this with, that's what the difference between a, just a monopoly and a, and a kind of just a big business, right? A monopoly actually runs the system and it isn't just controlling government, it is the government. And that's like the, the fundamental threat of, of monopolization is that that's your government. That's who tells you whether you can get access to that service. You know, I'm from Comcast and I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, one thing. Have you ever read uh, William Baumol's uh, paper on contestable markets and monopolistic no. competition? Well, you should. I the will. other <laughs> thing, I have a question for you about is, you know, you're talking about democracy, but what about freedom? Uh, for example, if a majority of people are telling me, uh, that I can or can't buy from somebody, uh, how is that freedom? And shouldn't the, ex the people's preferences be expressed more easily and agilely, uh, ag you know, with greater agility in the marketplace by deciding where they want to buy something rather than in the ballot box where you have a clunky regulatory system that imposes politicians' wills on people rather imperfectly? Yeah, so that's public choice economics um, right there. And uh, I mean, I think markets are political. Market structures are political. What we you know, can choose to buy and sell and who, the rules of those markets are always a political decision. And fundamentally, someone's got to make that decision about how we structure those markets. And either it's going to be democratic institutions or it's going to be autocratic ones. And there's just no way of avoiding that, that decision. If I don't want to pay taxes, I go to jail. If I don't want to go onto Facebook, Facebook doesn't get revenue from my clicks. 
Well, I will just say this. Uh, uh, first of all, okay, I'm not going to make a joke about tax avoidance, but <laughs> if you don't think you need, you may not need to buy something from a, uh, um, um, like Google or something like that, but there are many people that do. Uh, if you are a newspaper, you need you need to get access to Google and Facebook to, to distribute your product. If you're a farmer in the 1880s or 1890s, you need to buy services from the railroad or the or the or the granary to get your product to market. Um, these institutions have coercive power. Uh, they are private governments, and somebody who can kill your business, take food from your family, has power over you um, in a very profound way. So, or, or could, if we structure markets to allow for monopolization. And that's, I, I think I agree with you that liberty is incredibly important. And that's why marketplaces that don't allow for that concentration open up our culture for that liberty. Whereas marketplaces that allow only one entity to control or a, or, or a unified set of entities who work together in concert to control a marketplace are tyrannical. All right, so we have to end, so just this, a little bit uh, a promotion. So Matt is gonna be uh, also live streamed at another event at the Chicago Council of Foreign Affairs uh, in uh, actually in less than two hours. And then we're, he's going to be also uh, tomorrow at our at our uh, uh, at our conference uh, at Glitcher. The conference is, as uh, Simone said, is sold out. But you are all welcome to see it uh, uh, live stream on our on the Stigler uh, website. So, Matt, thank you very much, and thank you all.